Welcome back to another episode of Spilling Secrets, a podcast on all things related to trade secret and non-compete law. My name is Pete Steinmeier. I am the managing shareholder of Epstein, Becker & Green's Chicago office and one of the co-chairs of EBG's Trade Secrets and Non-Competes sub-practice. With me today for our final episode of 2023 are the original four secret spillers. Eric Weibust, a partner in EBG's Boston office and co-chair of the firm's Trade Secrets and Non-Competes sub-practice. Kate Rigby, also a partner in EBG's Boston office. And Millie Warner, senior counsel in EBG's New York office. Welcome all. I hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving. Hi, Pete. Hey, Pete. Hi, Pete. 2023 has been one of the most active years in recent memory in terms of trade secret and non-compete law. The federal administrative state has initiated an all-out frontal assault on non-competes through enforcement actions and rulemaking by various executive agencies. A state banned non-competes for the first time in more than 100 years and another came close to doing so. California, meanwhile, is attempting to nationalize its ban of non-competes, and a few sports teams have even gotten in on the action. Here at EBG, in addition to our very busy and successful practice in this area, we rolled out a comprehensive 50-state non-compete survey that is available for free on our website, and we are finalizing a 50-state healthcare-specific non-compete survey that we intend to roll out in early 2024. We also published dozens of posts on our blog, Trade Secrets and EmployeeMobility.com, and thought leadership in various outside publications. We spoke at numerous conferences across the country, and we are recording this, our 12th podcast episode of the year. This year, we also recorded two pods live for the first time. One is a live webinar, and another in front of a live audience at EBG's 42nd Annual Workforce Management Briefing in New York City. What a year it has been. Just like we did last year, we are ending 2023 with our top 10 list of developments in trade secret and restrictive covenant law. Eric, let's start off where we began the year and where I suspect we will end the top 10 list with the Federal Trade Commission, specifically some enforcement actions it has taken against companies who use non-competes. What can you tell us about that? I think it actually makes the most sense to take a very quick trip back in time to the beginning of the Biden administration when we talk about these enforcement actions. On July 9th, 2021, President Biden issued an executive order in which he, quote, encouraged the FTC to, quote, consider exercising its purported rulemaking authority to curtail the use and enforcement of non-competes. It was a very vague executive order, literally didn't say much more than that in terms of non-competes. And then nothing happened for about a year and a half. Nothing happened for the rest of 2021 in this space with regard to the FTC, and nothing happened at all in 2022 with respect to the FTC, except for a few public comment periods they had. Then as this year, 2023 kicked off on January 4th, we found out, or at least we thought we did, what the FTC was going to do with respect to non-competes. And we'll get to what else they did in a bit, as you mentioned. So on January 4th, the FTC announced that it had settled two previously undisclosed enforcement actions and entered into consent orders with three employers based on the novel legal theory that the employer's use of non-competes constituted an unfair method of competition in violation of Section 5 of the FTC Act. Commissioner Wilson was the lone dissenter, as Commissioner Phillips had previously resigned and was not yet replaced, in both cases. And she pointed out the lack of any reasonableness analysis and concluded one of them with what I thought was a pretty startling quote, in which she said, I wish it were accurate to say that this case, with apologies to Shakespeare, is a tale of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Unfortunately, it has great significance. It foreshadows how the commission will apply the new Section 5 policy statement. Practices that three unelected bureaucrats find distasteful will be labeled with nefarious adjectives and summarily condemned, with little to no evidence of harm to competition. I fear the consequences for our economy and for the FTC as an institution. And as an aside, Commissioner Wilson actually shortly thereafter resigned in a very fiery public letter to the Wall Street Journal. And then in June, the FTC finalized its consent orders with at least one of these companies. Uh, ultimately, it, it finalized them with all three. In the one in particular, it entered a consent order for a period of 20 years that required the company to, quote, cease and desist 
from directly or indirectly entering or attempting to enter into, maintaining or attempting to maintain, enforcing or attempting to enforce, or threatening to enforce any non-compete agreement for certain employee classifications identified by the FTC. The consent order also required the respondent, the employer, to provide an FTC-approved notice letter to each employee stating that the employee is not subject to a non-compete provision. And in addition, for a period of 10 years, the employer must provide notice of the order to officers and directors, as well as employees involved in the hiring process, and submit annual compliance reports to the FTC. And they have an affirmative obligation to notify the FTC of any change in any dissolution, acquisition, merger, or consolidation of any of the companies. So this was a big deal. It was the first time the FTC uh, in its history has taken any specific enforcement action with respect to the use and enforcement of non-competes. And as we'll find out in a bit, they went actually further than that the following day. Thanks, Eric. Kate, number nine on the list of top 10 trade secret and non-developments this year is the emergence of trade secrets and non-competes in the wide world of sports. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, so this is a fun one, at least maybe for us. So first up is basketball, and it's with the New York Knicks and the Toronto Raptors. So in August of this year, the New York Knicks sued the Toronto Raptors in the Southern District of New York for allegedly stealing confidential and proprietary information, thousands of documents, according to the complaint, which included things like scouting reports and videos, play frequency reports, a prep book for the 22-23 season, and other various confidential information. And in the complaint, the New York Knicks accuse a former Knicks employee, a video coordinator, of illegally obtaining and then disclosing that information to Raptors employees, including the Raptors head coach and the player development coach. And again, according to the complaint, the Raptors began recruiting this video coordinator this summer. And before he left the Knicks to join the Raptors, He forwards this information to his Gmail account, which is a story we've all seen (laughs) before. And then he shared it with the Raptors, allegedly. And again, this information included scouting reports. It included data and analytics, including information like play calls and play frequencies, confidential information that the Knicks would use, of course, to compete with its rival NBA teams. The Knicks also alleged that the Raptors, including two of their coaches, conspired with this former Knicks employee. Again, a story we've seen a lot in litigation that that we all have handled. In the complaint, they're seeking injunctive relief, but also damages. And in subsequent filing, in fact, just before Thanksgiving, they specifically noted that they were seeking in excess of $10 million. So these are sort of uncommon within professional sports teams, and there's been some arguments already about whether or not this should really be fought in the court or whether it should be fought pursuant to the NBA Constitution and in front of the NBA commissioner. But the Knicks in filings have already argued that that should not occur, that it really should be fought out in court, that this is a civil issue, but also potentially a criminal issue. And it also made some arguments about some coziness between the NBA commissioner and the uh, Raptors governor. So that will be an interesting thing to follow. Eric, as you predicted at the end of last year, the DOJ has continued to prosecute criminal no poach cases this year. So for number eight on our list of top 10 developments this year, can you remind our listeners what those are and give an update as to how successful the DOJ has been and what recent developments have just happened within the past week? Sure thing, Pete. Uh, As you mentioned, in 2023, the DOJ has continued with its criminal no-poach prosecutions, but no pun intended here, it seems to be petering out towards the end of this year. As a reminder to begin, no-poach agreements are different than what we call employee or co-worker non-solicits in that no-poach agreements are horizontal restraints between competitors in the labor market. They don't have to be competitors in the service or product market, but they're competing for employees, and so they're competitors in the labor market. That type of restraint, horizontal restraints, are typically treated as per se violations of the antitrust laws when they're naked, which means that they're not ancillary to a legitimate business collaboration. And an example of a legitimate business collaboration where a a no poach agreement may be permissible would be in the sale of a business, a joint venture agreement, a legitimate collaboration agreement, and things like that. On the other hand, non-solicits are vertical restraints between an employer and an employee and are analyzed under the rule of reason, which is why we often, when we litigate these things, we're dealing with whether the restraint is reasonable or not. Although we don't typically talk about them in terms of antitrust law or the rule of reason, we are doing a reasonableness analysis. 
The other major difference between these two types of agreements has to do with notice. When you've got an employer and an employee who have a non-solicit agreement, the employee knows about it. It's in the agreement. They signed it. They received consideration for it, and they know what their obligations are when they leave. In a no-poach agreement between two competitors, the employees who are subject to the no-poach agreement, meaning company A can't hire company B's employees, often don't even know it exists. And frankly, these cases sometimes come to light when an employee goes to a competitor, tries to get a job, somebody lets it slip that there's an agreement with their current employer that they can't hire them, and somebody blows the whistle to the DOJ and and they're off to the races with a criminal prosecution. Now, two things happened this year that led to my initial comment about perhaps this slowing down a bit. The first was that the DOJ had one of its last remaining cases dismissed, and that was in the District of Connecticut. And this was its fourth major loss in a row. In fact, the DOJ has never won one of these cases. They did obtain a guilty verdict on a small one at one point, but going to trial, they've never won one of these. And they've previously taken the position that they're going to continue prosecuting them because they're winning at the motion to dismiss stage oftentimes, meaning that they do have the authority to do this and that they're losing when it comes to showing ancillarity, meaning the defendants are able to show that these agreements that they're being prosecuted for were, in fact, ancillary to a legitimate business collaboration. But in this case, the the DOJ's case was dismissed by the District of Connecticut. And then just this month, and we're recording here in November for publication in December, but earlier this month, the DOJ voluntarily dismissed the final ongoing case it had. That was a case in Texas against outpatient medical care facility operator. And for whatever reason, most of these cases have been in the in the healthcare field including the one that was dismissed in Connecticut and and including this one, of course. And we'll have to see whether the DOJ has lost its appetite to continue pursuing these. It's not often that the DOJ will voluntarily dismiss any criminal prosecution, much less one of these. And they did so here in the what they said in the interests of justice. I'm curious to see what will happen in 2024 and whether they'll regroup, try to find some new targets and continue pursuing these, or if we'll see them slowly start to go away. I suspect we'll see more of them, but only time will tell. Eric, on a related issue, the DOJ normally has a very high success rate or conviction rate when they take cases to trial. Do you have any theories as to why they have been having so much difficulty getting convictions with no poach cases? I think the reason is because they're so new. I was on a panel last year with one of the prosecutors from the DOJ's antitrust division, and they said this is common when they first when they have a new novel theory that they're prosecuting, oftentimes as they're working out the kinks, when they're creating new law at the motion to dismiss stage, they may be losing the cases ultimately, but they're essentially building up precedent for their authority to even bring them. And then ultimately they start winning them and then they get to where you where you suggested, Pete, which is where they're winning most of them. So he's this guy suggested and uh, Attorney General Cantor, who leads the antitrust division has suggested that they will continue pursuing these, even though they're losing at trial for that very reason, and that they expect to start winning these soon. Now, again, that was before they voluntarily dismissed this latest case. So we'll have to see whether that's a sign of anything or if that was just a one-off case that they decided wasn't worth pursuing. Thanks, Eric. Millie, number seven on the list is that Delaware courts have been very active this year in terms of restrictive covenant decisions in particular, and not necessarily in a good way from an employer's perspective. Can you highlight the most important of those Delaware decisions? Sure, Pete. So uh, starting off the year on uh, January 4th, 2023, the Chancery Court of Delaware declined to enforce a restrictive covenant and forfeiture provisions in the limited partnership agreement, finding that the covenants were facially overbroad and also a declining to blue pencil those provisions. So basically the, the worst of all possible worlds for the uh, employer uh, see- seeking to enforce those provisions. The court also applied a Delaware's reasonableness test to invalidate a forfeiture provision that would have required the return of capital and deferred compensation um, in the event that the employee breached the restrictive covenants. So then a few months after that, uh, in March of 2023, the Chancery Court dismissed a complaint based on a a non-compete accompanying the sale of a business, ruling that a five-year non-compete against the company's founder was unenforceable because its geographic scope, which was anywhere in the world, extended to territories that were not touched by the previous employer and therefore were deemed to be unreasonable. Then last summer, last August, the Chancery Court refused to apply Delaware law despite a Delaware choice of law provision 
and also summarily refused to perform and enforce reportedly overly broad agreement with a stockholder slash former manager of an acquired company. Certainly some developments that were not particularly favorable to companies seeking to enforce these types of restrictions. Thanks, Millie. Kate, it used to be that you could pretty much draft a nationwide confidentiality agreement and pretty much whatever language you wanted to have in there, and the courts were likely to enforce it. But that is no longer the case, which is bringing me to number six on our list of the top 10 developments, namely the continued attack on the usage of confidentiality agreements. What's the latest on that? As quick background, just last year in 2022, several states like Washington, Maine, and Oregon passed laws limiting confidentiality provisions. And they went, those laws went a little beyond what prior states like California and New York and New Jersey had passed in somewhat recent years. Generally speaking, they required that non-disclosure agreements make clear that despite the non-disclosure requirements, they did not prohibit disclosure of things like discrimination, harassment, sexual assault, wage and hour violations, and of course, the underlying facts regarding each of those issues. Now, these laws still allowed the prohibition of disclosure of trade secrets and proprietary information, of course, as long as those trade secrets and private information were not involved, essentially, or, or about right illegal activity. That was the state of the law in 2022, and that still continues into 2023. It's long been best practice to include carve-outs for confidentiality agreements, um, including carve-outs for possible violations, reporting of possible violations, federal law or regulations, including whistleblower laws, and so specifically stating that it doesn't prohibit individuals from contacting or reporting such violations to government agencies like the EEOC, Department of Justice, the SEC, Congress, Inspector General, et cetera. And these NDAs that we're talking about, these non-disclosure agreements, those are many times in restrictive covenant agreements, but they can be found in handbooks and severance agreements, separation agreements, and other company policies. So in 2023, that trend continued, and also from a federal perspective. So the NLRB and the SEC was really ta- has really taken aim at these and continued their sort of view of these. In February of 2023, in the McLaren-McComb decision, the NLRB found it unlawful for an employer to proffer a severance agreement with broad non-disparagement, but also confidentiality provisions. And in the board's view, these type of provisions can infringe on employees' rights to discuss things like wages, working conditions, et cetera, with others, also reporting them to the NLRB and getting insistence from the NLRB. And the language specifically at issue in this case, the confidentiality provision, was not all that special, really, and it wasn't really all that controversial in and of itself. But it was noteworthy that the provision at issue included none of the carve-outs that have really been best practice for quite a while. And so that is certainly one issue that employers need to really make sure of, that they are including those those type of carve-outs. As it relates to the SEC this year, 2023, it really continued an increased focus on non-disclosure agreements and other confidential business information provisions to ensure that whistleblowers are not restricted from freely communicating with the SEC. And so some examples of that in February 2023, the SEC issued a $35 million fine against um, Activision Blizzard for, among other issues, finding that the company's agreement violated Rule 21F, which is the rule that prohibits employers from imposing policies that somehow infringe on or impede employees from communicating with the SEC um, concerning violations, whistleblowing violations. So that was one. There's been another in September of 2023, the SEC issued another cease and desist order imposing significant sanctions against a company that included a confidential information provision in an agreement that prohibited employees from voluntarily communicating with the SEC about potential disclosure of confidential information. The continued trend of including some of these provisions, yes, you can still, of course, protect trade secrets via confidential or NDAs, and you can still prohibit the disclosure of confidential information. But companies should really take notice of ensuring that they're including the required carve-outs to make sure we don't run afoul of state law, but also have the NLRB, the SEC, or other agencies taking aim at those provisions. Yeah, thanks, Kate. I mean, that's a really interesting point to make, which is that companies can still achieve all of their objectives in terms of protecting their trade secrets and confidential information, but they really need to be a lot more careful when drafting these agreements. They need to review them, and they need to make certain that they've got all of the up-to-date 
carve out language. And I know that I've been updating my forms and, and doing this for clients and you can do it, but you just have to be very aware of the recent developments in this area of the law. But thank you. Okay, Millie, which brings us to number five on our list this year and what could have been number one on the list and may still yet be number one as we are recording this on November 29, 2023. But the legislature in your home state of New York voted to ban non-competes this year. The governor has yet to sign or veto it. And again, there could be action by the time this podcast is released. But could you please provide some context for the legislation and let us know where all of this stands? Sure, Pete. As you said, last summer, this legislation was passed by the New York State Assembly and is currently uh, awaiting um, signature by the the government. Basically, it would prohibit uh, non-compete agreements in New York State with employees, uh, defining a a non-compete agreement to mean any agreement between an employer and and an employee that prohibits or restricts uh, the employee from obtaining employment after the conclusion of employment with the employer. The bill is silent about non-solicit agreements. So that's one outstanding question. And there are actually a a number of of outstanding questions that would certainly need to uh, likely be litigated if the bill actually becomes law. But as you mentioned, it is sitting on the desk of the governor still awaiting signature. And if it is signed, it will become effective um, 30 days after the uh, signature by the governor. Thanks, Millie. Kate, number four on our list this year, not to be outdone by New York, but the California legislature passed and the California governor signed several new non-compete laws this year that could have a national effect. Can you please tell us what those new laws do? Just as background on this, California has long banned non-compete agreements and customer non-solicitations. And unless one of the narrow statutory exception applies, Section 16600 of California law prohibits any contract that restrains a person from, quote, engaging in any lawful profession, trade, or business of any kind, and basically states that if you have such a contract, it is void. And so essentially that means, right, non-competes and and customer non-solicitations are void. But importantly, California law had not previously provided employees with any type of private right of action, allowing employees to sue for damages when you are attempting to enforce a non-compete that may be unenforceable. But that is now changing, effective January 1st. And then there's many other changes as well. So we can walk through each of those. So SB 699, which is effective January 1st of 2024, amended California law 16600, as well as adding new subsections to the statute in several different ways. First, it explicitly provides that any agreement that is void under section 16600 is unenforceable in California, regardless of where and when the agreement was signed. So agreements signed outside of California, and arguably if the employee is working in California, residing in California, maybe even potentially providing services to California, but maybe living outside of California while providing those services, that would be void. And so this means that if the employee worked and resided outside of California, to the extent the employee subsequently obtains employment in California, maybe moves to California, et cetera, they may be and likely be able to argue that agreement is now void. This is really consistent with the sort of historical approach by California, but it's now really codifying that. The second way it amends it is that while California law currently only voids unlawful restrictive covenants, as I said before, it now explicitly makes it unlawful for employers or former employers to attempt to enforce a non-compete or an otherwise void restrictive covenant regardless of whether the agreement containing the non-compete was signed outside of California or if the employee was outside, previously outside of California. And it makes it unlawful for employers to enter into a non-compete with an employee or prospective employee. It also allows for current, former, and prospective employees to, as I said earlier, with a private right of action to seek not only injunctive relief, but actual damages against the current or former employer, essentially. And so they are entitled to not only those damages, but also reasonable attorney's fees and costs. Previously, employees might seek declaratory relief in these situations. But again, now this is allowing for them to affirmatively file a private right of action, which, again, I think ups the analysis when employers are trying to determine, do we actually have a non-compete that's enforceable? Is there an argument that this person can claim 
that California law should apply here. And not only is that contract void, but perhaps they may be able to have an action against us for damages. So shortly thereafter, California then amended Section 16600 again, adding an additional subsection by establishing notice obligations for employers. And this new amendment said that beginning as of January of 2024, it will be unlawful for the employer to include a non-compete clause or require an employee to enter into one of these agreements. And then also requires employers to actually notify employees no later than February 14th of next year, so on Valentine's Day, both current and former employees who were employed with that company on or after January 1st of 2022, that those non-compete clauses are void. It really requires companies to take a look at what agreements that they have in place with employees who were employed after that date of January 1st, 2022, who should receive these notices whether you want to potentially remove those clauses now to avoid having to comply with these notices. And so there'll be a lot for employers who are dealing with employees potentially providing services in California about what next steps to take. Thanks, Kate. My takeaway in California is that non-competes have long been banned there, but this certainly ratchets up the stakes and increases the incentives and the need for employers to really focus even more closely on potential non-compete issues in California. Fair takeaway? Absolutely fair takeaway. I think there's a lot of unanswered questions that once this goes into effect, there will be probably a lot of increased litigation answering some of those questions. So proceed with extreme caution in California. That's my Chicago guy's takeaway. (laughs) Agreed. (laughs) Okay. Millie, back to you for number three on our list. Another federal attack on non-competes, this time from the National Labor Relations Board. Can you please fill our listeners in on what the NLRB has been up to? Sure. So last spring, the NLRB issued a general counsel memo instructing the regional directors of the NLRB that the NLRB's position is that non-compete clauses for employees who are protected by the National Labor Relations Act, in other words, non-managerial, non-supervisory employees, in employment contracts and severance agreements violate the federal labor law where those restrictions may reasonably tend to chill employees in exercising their Section 7 rights under the federal labor law to improve the uh, terms and conditions of their employment. Basically, the theory is that non-competes tend to cut off an employee's access to other employment opportunities and may therefore chill employees from engaging in their Section 7 rights because they know that they will have greater difficulty replacing their income if they end up being fired for exercising their statutory rights to improve their working conditions. So pretty soon after the NLRB issued that memo, last June, the NLRB brought an enforcement action against a Michigan-based company alleging that it maintained overbroad provisions in its confidentiality, non-solicitation, non-compete agreement. Now, that action ended up being settled fairly quickly, but soon after that, on September 1, the NLRB regional director in Ohio issued a complaint against another company alleging that it maintained unlawful non-compete provisions in its offer letters, agreements, and handbook, as well as other allegedly unlawful provisions regarding uh, confidentiality, non-disparagement, and non-solicitation. We'll see how how that case develops as it works its way through the administrative process. But in any event, it's become quite clear that the NLRB does intend to act uh, fairly aggressively when it comes to post-employment restrictive covenants that it deems to have a chilling effect on employees engaging in Section 7 activity. Thanks, Millie. As the lone Midwesterner on the podcast, I will handle number two on our list of top 10 developments this year, which is Minnesota's ban of non-competes. Minnesota is the first state to ban non-competes in over 100 years, and it has become only the fourth state to do so. The others are California, Oklahoma, and North Dakota. Minnesota's ban is effective for such agreements entered into on or after July 1, 2023. It is not retroactive. It's only prospective. The only exceptions to the ban are non-competes in agreements relating to the sale or dissolution of a business. A covenant not to compete in Minnesota is defined as excluding NDAs and non-solicitation provisions, and the law states that no other provisions in an agreement containing a non-compete shall be affected. The law also prohibits employers from requiring employees to agree to clauses 
designating choice of law and venue of any state other than Minnesota. Employees seeking to enforce the non-compete ban will also be allowed to recover reasonable attorney's fees. Which leads us to the number one development in trade secret and non-compete law in 2023. Eric, take it away. Thanks, Pete. As I mentioned at the beginning, on January 4th, 2023, the FTC announced that it had settled several previously undisclosed enforcement actions. And we and others who practice in this space said, aha, we now know what the Biden administration is going to do or the FTC is going to do with respect to non-competes. We all started writing our blog posts and getting articles out about it and figured we knew what was happening. That was until January 5th, the next day. On January 5th, the FTC announced that it was proposing a rule that would ban non-competes nationwide for the first time in its history. And looking back to January 4th, one could think, a cynical person like myself could think, that the reason that they announced the settlement of these enforcement actions on that day was so that they could point back to their quote-unquote history with enforcing and addressing non-competes, and that non-competes fall under their purview, despite the fact that in their 100-year history, the FTC had never gone after anybody for using non-competes and had never proposed a rule that would regulate, much less ban non-competes. So what would the rule do if passed? And we'll talk about the procedure in a bit. The rule would prohibit all post-employment non-competes virtually. And although it doesn't specifically apply to customer or employee non-solicits or NDAs, and it doesn't expressly apply to garden leave provisions, it does prohibit what they call de facto non-competes. And by that, they mean some other provision that's not a traditional non-compete, but could act in a way to prevent an employee from going to work for a competitor. And one example they give is an overbroad non-disclosure agreement that would, because it's so broad, it wouldn't allow the employee to go work for a competitor because they would necessarily breach that non-disclosure agreement. Again, that's just an example. There's no real meat on the bones as to what a de facto non-compete is that could change over time either with this commission or future commissions. So it really does leave a gaping hole in terms of what would be covered as a de facto non-compete. Now, the sole exception to the ban would be a very limited sale of a business exception. And it's very narrow because it would only apply to owners of at least 25% of equity in the company. And that is essentially a non-exception because very few companies have uh, owners that, are, that own more than 25% of the company other than small family businesses and startups. Once you start getting investment from venture capitalists, private equity, certainly when you go public, no individual, in particular an individual working at the company is likely to have 25%. This is stricter even than California, which does have an exception for the sale of a business. Kate mentioned some of the exceptions. One of them is the sale of a business exception. And there, it just has to be that you're selling your goodwill in the company. And there's no specific cutoff of 25% or even 10% or 5%. The rule is it can't be a sham transaction, meaning you can't give an employee one share of stock, require them to resell it upon termination, and then subject them to a quote-unquote sale of a business non-compete. So this exception, although an exception in writing, is not really much of an exception in practice. The rule would also expressly preempt inconsistent state law and it would purports to be retroactive and require rescission and notice, meaning companies that use non-competes currently would not only have to rescind them for existing employees and employees who no longer work there, but may still be subject to a non-compete, may still be in their restricted period, and they'd have to provide notice to those employees as well. The FTC said they're taking this action for a variety of reasons. The proposed rule was 200 plus pages in length, and FTC Chair Lena Khan published an op-ed in the New York Times explaining some of her rationale, some of the commission's rationale for this rule, which included that non-competes systemically drive down wages, even for workers who aren't bound by them. They reduce entrepreneurship and startup formation, and they lead to higher prices for consumers by reducing competition. We've written several articles explaining why this is simply not true, or at the very least, it's not supported by conclusive evidence, but that is their rationale. So what came next was that a public comment period was open and was ultimately extended. And during that period, almost 17,000 comments were submitted, both by individuals, many of whom said, I don't like non-competes, this is a great rule, and also by industry organizations. And we represented several chambers of commerce and, and national industry organizations to submit commentary, which typically 
focused on the fact that A, the FTC doesn't have the authority to promulgate this rule, and B, the non-competes are not in, in this particular industry or in this particular geographic area are not typically used in the ways that the FTC suggests they are, which is to harm and coerce low-wage workers. And frankly, that, that if that is their concern, there are narrower ways of addressing that concern. So what comes next is that Bloomberg reported that they're likely to issue a final rule in April. We'll see if that happens. I frankly expected to see it by now, but maybe April is when it will come out. And then legal challenge will certainly follow. And we expect uh, an injunction, nationwide injunction to be entered virtually immediately. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce has said publicly that they will file a lawsuit. Other groups certainly will file lawsuits as well. And there will be challenges under the major questions doctrine, which we've written and talked about, the non-delegation doctrine. There will be challenges to the rule being arbitrary and capricious because the bases that the commission said were the bases for the rule are not actually supported by evidence and perhaps under the Fifth Amendment takings clause. So 2024, again, will be a big year for non-competes at the federal level, whether it's with the NLRB as Millie talked about, or or certainly with the FTC and, and what they decide to do come April or, or whenever they do something next. Thanks, Eric. I certainly agree that 2024 is going to be an interesting year for legal developments in this area. Thanks to you and Kate and Millie and everybody who's behind the scenes for another successful year of Spilling Secrets. And a special thank you to all of our guest podcasters this year, including our EBG colleagues, Jim Flynn, Stuart Gerson, David Jacobs, Dan Levy, Phil Antablin, Aaron Schaefer, Steve Swirsky, Jimmy O, and Susan gross And a special thank you to our outside guests this year, Stephanie Southwick from Law Finance Group, Mary Guzman from Crown Jewel Insurance, Andrew Lilly from Deloitte Legal, Evan Michael from NFP, and Gina Saracino from Thompson Reuters. And of course, thank you to all of our listeners who have made Spilling Secrets one of the most successful trade secret and restrictive covenant podcasts in the country. Thanks again for joining. Until next year, this is Pete Steinmeier signing off on behalf of the Spilling Secrets team. We hope that you and yours have a happy and prosperous new year. This podcast is presented by Epstein, Becker & Green, PC. All rights are reserved. This audio recording includes information about legal issues and legal developments. Such materials are for informational purposes only and may not reflect the most current legal developments. These informational materials are not intended and should not be taken as legal advice on any particular set of facts or circumstances, and these materials are not a substitute for the advice of competent counsel. The content reflects the personal views and opinions of the participants. No attorney-client relationship has been created by this audio recording. This audio recording may be considered attorney advertising in some jurisdictions under the applicable law and ethical rules. The determination of the need for legal services and the choice of a lawyer are extremely important decisions and should not be based solely upon advertisements or self-proclaimed expertise. No representation is made that the quality of legal services to be performed is greater than the quality of legal services performed by other lawyers.